Hello, everybody. My name is Hippocrates Pandis, and uh, today I'm going to talk about the evolution of Amazon Redshift. This is work that happened over uh, many years by hundreds of people, and I am honored to be here and present this to you. Uh, Redshift is Amazon's cloud data warehouse. Uh, it is uh, one of the most popular and fastest cloud data warehouses out there. We are very careful when we're making public statements about the usage of our services. And we have gone publicly and said that uh, every day, tens of thousands of customers use Redshift to process exabytes of data, plural, uh, in AWS's global infrastructure of 26 launched regions and 84 availability zones. Uh, because it's late in the day today, it is fair to assume uh, that uh, already our systems for the day have processed over one exabyte of data. And tomorrow it's going to be a new day, several exabytes of data will be processed again. So we are talking about a very large system here. And this talk is about the evolution of the system. How we took Redshift from uh, what, what it was back in 2013 when we launched as the first cloud data warehouse to what we are today uh, over and how we evolved the system trying to drive uh, to meet uh, customer demands over the years. And I'm going to also give you a glimpse of where we're heading towards. So let's get started. Um, if one has to categorize where we are putting our energy as a service, you can say that we are, used, we are focused in six thematic areas. The first and the most important is security and availability. Our customers trust us to store, safely store exabytes of data and have that uh, data available for them to access. So our uh, first and most important priority is to keep this data secure and available for them. The next area where we focus our energy, and in some sense, it is kind of on the DNA of Redshift, is performance. Uh, Redshift is the industry, uh, it ha has industry leading price performance. In order to understand how we get this performance, we need to look a little under the hood to understand how the system is architected and operates. So let's, let's see how Redshift works. Uh, in general, uh, Redshift consists of two layers. The one layer is the compute layer, and the other one is the storage layer, the Redshift managed storage. On the compute layer, Redshift has two types of nodes. Uh, at the bottom, at the top, there is the leader node, which is the entrance to the system. Customers connect to this endpoint and they submit their jobs. And then there are a bunch of worker nodes or compute nodes that execute this work, this the, jo the job that has been submitted. Whenever a customer submits a statement, it gets parsed, uh, logically rewritten, cost-based optimized, and we go and generate a distributed query execution plan that we're about to execute. Then what we do is for every query fragment of this optimized distributed query execution plan, we go and generate C++ code that we GCC compile and we take the optimized code, we send it down to the compute nodes for them to execute. The compute nodes go and start pulling data from the uh, data sets they are assigned to and they start uh, doing whatever this uh, uh, fragment wants to do. And we do a bunch of tricks along the way. We use uh, zone maps, uh, we use uh, vectorized execution, we use proprietary encodings to make these uh, operations very fast. But that's about it. The architecture of Redshift is very simple. Let's dig a little more into how we do that, how we, we how kind of on the core of the system, which is the code generation. And let's take a very simple example, as a query like the one I have there which uh, what it does, it joins two tables, applies a filter and calculates an aggregation on top of that. What Redshift ends up doing, it generates some uh, a, a piece of code that looks a lot like the one I have on the left-hand side of this slide. And you can see it, actually, you can read it. It scans two columns, applies a filter, probes a hash table, cal calculates an aggregate, and that's it. Actually, the code we, we execute is a little more complicated than that. For example, we do a bunch of tricks to minimize data cache uh, stalls, access stalls. Um, we use AVX2 vectorized execution as opposed to this scalar code. We have min max pruning. We use late materialization. But at the end of the day, you can, you can imagine that what we execute is some, a piece of code that it is highly optimized for the underlying architecture. People sometimes when I talk about it, they ask me, and aren't you worried about the cost of compiling C++ code and executing it on the fly? 
Uh, indeed, this can become, uh, become a, a substantial overhead, especially on short running queries. On long running queries that run for minutes or for hours, the impact of that is small, but for short running queries, it may become significant. In, in, in order to minimize this overhead, we do all sorts of caching. For example, on the leader node of every uh, Redshift compute environment, we, uh, we have a cache which we use to remember all the compiled codes uh, fragments we have ever executed. And that cache uh, helps us to have a has substantial cache history rate in the order of 99.5%. And the reason for this high cache history rate is because many, many workloads are very repetitive. But that was not enough for a cloud service such as Redshift. So over the recent years, we introduced a compilation service which works as follows. Anytime we execute, a, we have to execute a fragment that we don't see in our caches, we push it down to a compilation service that consists of a bunch of worker uh, nodes that take these uh, snippets of code, they compile it with optimal optimizations and, uh, and publish this code in a global code cache. And then all the clusters in the globe that want to execute the same fragment of code, they find this code there. By doing this very simple trick and by relying in global services such as Dynamo Global Tables of AWS, we are able to improve the cache hit rate of, uh, of the compiled code cache from 99.5 to over 99.96%. This is the things you can do in the cloud you could not be able to do in the traditional on-premises world. And by doing all these tricks, Redshift maintains its price performance leadership. Uh, for example, uh, in these graphs that I took from a blog post we posted recently, we compare our, uh, our service against other popular cloud data warehouses. And we compare them in two different benchmarks. In one, which we call the out-of-box uh, benchmark, where a customer literally just defines some tables, loads some data, and starts running the, the queries, the benchmark. And in the other one, the tuned version, where they spend, we spend some time to optimize the physical design of the database in order to, to get the best performance out of that. As you can see, Redshift uh, maintains price performance leadership, both in out-of-box uh, experiment, as well as in the tuned one, between 20% and 3.8 times better price performance than the competition. Even more important for us is the good scalability of the system. In this experiment, which I took from the lab, we are running the cloud data warehouse benchmark model after TPCDS. And what we do is we scaled up the data set size from 10 terabytes all the way up to one petabyte. So we increase the uh, this data set size by two orders of magnitude. At the same time, we increase the hardware by two orders of magnitude. And what we measure here is the total time to run this benchmark. As you can see, the time it took to run this benchmark uh, it remains pretty much the same, even though we increase the data set size by, size by two orders of magnitude. This nice predictable scalability is a very good property of our system. Our customers really like it because they, they don't get surprised uh, by additional charges as their workload increases, as, as the data set size increases. So that's the core of the system. Redshift is a very fast execution, query execution engine. When we did that, customers loved that. Uh, uh, Redshift was the first uh, cloud data warehouse out there and customers were really happy. But then they came back to us and they said, we really like your service, but we would like to store more data and have more concurrent users using the service. And that's where we focused a lot of our energy. The biggest architectural change we did in the service the past eight, nine years has been the introduction of Redshift managed storage. Before that, the data in a Redshift uh, cluster was, uh, was stored in the cluster, in local attached storage of this cluster. But uh, facilitated by the fact that we are operating on, on Nitro hardware, AWS is Nitro hardware that has much higher network bandwidth, we were able to disaggregate the storage and now have separate compute storage layers and be able to scale those independently. And that addressed the, the challenge with, when it comes to storage elasticity. When it comes to compute elasticity, we do two main uh, changes in the system. The first one, which we call elastic resize, was to introduce the ability within seconds to increase or decrease the size of any Redshift compute environment by a factor of four. 
So you can go four times larger or four times lower. So a range of 16 X in your computing environment so that customers can use that to fine tune the, 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 the latency of their individual queries to meet their SLAs. And once they tune the size of their main compute environment appropriately, there still might be cases where they do have some bursts of activity. Think about the Monday morning where all the employees of the company go back to the office and start want to run the reporting to see how, how we are doing for the week. When this kind of burst of activity is coming and some queuing is piling up, what we do is we introduce a new feature, feature an auto-scaling feature, which we call it concurrency scaling, where we detect this kind of queuing. And if it is, is piling up, we bring equi-sized additional Redshift clusters and we start spilling over and start running queries on these clusters. And by doing that, we are able to linearly increase the throughput of the system. And when the, the, the wall load comes down, we contract back to a one main Redshift compute environment. And the interesting thing with that is that the customers do not have to do a single change in their application. They just start continuously being connected to one endpoint and the system starts start scaling uh, transparently to them. In this graph, I'm just plotting the throughput, the concurrency, the throughput one could get from uh, a four node DC to eight accelerated cluster running the TPCDS uh, benchmark uh, through the year uh, 2019. At the beginning of that year, the maximum throughput one could get is up, was approximately 200 queries per hour by five concurrent users submitting queries with zero think time. By the end of the year, after we introduced the, the new feature and we kept on improving on it, we were able to get over 12,000 queries per hour by 210 concurrent users submitting queries with zero think time, which obviously emulates thousands of concurrent users in a realistic scenario. That is, we were able to offer 60x higher concurrency from the same endpoint without the customer having to change a single line of code. This is kind of, again, the beautiful things one can get when moves to the cloud from, and you don't, you could not get in the traditional on-premises world. So by introducing elastic resize and concurrent scaling, we were able to address the compute elasticity needs of a single redshift endpoint. Customers were happy, but they start coming back to us and they said, okay, we're happy with elasticity, but we would also like isolation. We would like to be able to be free to spin up an independent Redshift endpoint, move some of our workload there, uh, and being able to access the main data set that it is being curated by some other cluster. And that's what we did. We introduced a feature that it is called the Redshift data sharing, where uh, consumer clusters can access, a producer cluster can give access to consumer clusters, and they can access the data, the live data of this producer cluster through Redshift managed storage by maintaining serializable snapshot isolation, which is the default isolation level we provide as a service. And this data sharing can happen across clusters in the same account, across account, or even across regions. So we have built a, a, a globally distributed uh, uh, data sharing service that, uh, that maintains serializable snapshot isolation, which is pretty impressive. So by, uh, with, with the, the introduction of Redshift Mana Storage and addressing a, a, a compute elasticity and auto scaling and data sharing, we were, we were able to address there the demands of our customers for storage and compute elasticity. The next thing they told us our customers was that you AWS have a very rich set of services that have also very valuable data and we would like to use them as part of our day-to-day -day analysis. And that's what we did. When we launched the service, they, Redshift was a, a traditional warehouse where custom, customers used to load data and run their uh, business intelligence. Uh, soon after, we introduced a feature which we call Spectrum, which allows Redshift not only to access the data stored in the data warehouse, but also access the data stored in open file formats in S3. Amazon has a very wide set of operational stores. In particular, you have Aurora and RDS, MySQL, and Postgres databases. Uh, our customers store the system, use the, these databases as their systems of record, and they ask us to be able to access this data. So that's what we did. We introduced the ability to run queries between the operational stores, the warehouse, as well as the open file formats in S3. 
and also we integrated with the streams as customers continuously in, and increasingly use streaming as a means to ingest data into a warehouse. Further, customers told us we don't want to be able to have to export data to run machine learning on these data sets. Uh, and we, what we did was we then created with Amazon SageMaker so that customers within SQL, they can train models that can get populated in Amazon SageMaker. And they also can run inference that lo they look like SQL functions for uh, the Redshift SQL user. We also integrated with Lambda to have a generic computer and, uh, environment for running uh, arbitrary compute uh, through SQL. So we converted the, data, the classic, the traditional data warehouse to a very well integrated service across AWS. We did all this, customers were happy, but uh, one thing that they told us is that still Redshift is still a little difficult to use. I need to have a DBA to run this maintain data administ database administrator operations. And I, they don't want to do that, especially they don't want to do that. So we have been spending a lot of our energy on introducing autonomics and trying to make the system as easy to use as possible. For example, we try at times of no or low activity in any compute environment, we maintain a list of what, what are the operations one could do automatically that would improve the overall uh, health or performance of the system. So we may decide to run some analyze in the background or some vacuum or maintain our incrementally maintain our materialized use or create materialized use or change the physical schema of a, of a table if we think that this is the most appropriate thing to do in order to improve the overall performance of the system. And we do that with no intervention from the database administrator. We take all these mundane operations and we make it our problem. You can read the paper for further pointers of how we learn how, how, what algorithm, algorithms we use to recommend uh, and change the distribution key or the sort key of tables. You can also read about uh, the algorithm we use to automatically create and delete materialized use if we feel that it is appropriate to do so. So we have been transforming the service to a more opinionated, more uh, uh, data warehouse that tries to improve the performance of the system for the customer. Still, uh, one feedback we got was that uh, the service still requires some thinking. Uh, as a customer, I need to think about how, what instance type to use for my warehouse computer environment, how many nodes, and, and whatnot. So over the past one year, we have been work working on a new serverless experience for Redshift. What we did there, we took all this technology, and we added an additional intelligent dynamic compute management layer. So we use machine learning there to uh, predict uh, and, uh, and optimize the, to predict the workload and optimize the resources we allocate. We decide when to auto scale. We decide when we to run maintenance. And we do that in an environment and an experience that it is a pay, pay for use, pay as you go model. And you keep maintaining the same SQL uh, interface and all the capabilities I described to you earlier, such as data sharing and integration with all the other data sources. And that's where we are as a service right now. We have tens of thousands of customers using Redshift to process exabytes of data daily. We have a global operation. We are very much focused on, on the leaders in price performance. Uh, we have uh, the ability with the introduction of the Redshift managed storage to store uh, tens of petabytes of data in a single Redshift endpoint and have thousands of concurrent users consuming that endpoint. We have a very tight integration with a very rich uh, ecosystem of AWS services. We are spending a lot of our energy on becoming smarter in autonomics and ease of use. And we are offering that now also in a, in a, in a revamped uh, serverless experience for our customers. And as we like to say at AWS, it is still day one. There is a lot of innovation to be done in the cloud and in the data warehousing world. And we are more than excited for the future. Thank you very much.